I am Madhu Sridhar. I am the president of the League of Women Voters of San Antonio. And on behalf of the League, I welcome you all this evening for a very good program on gun violence, what can be done. For those of you who are not familiar with the League, I just want to mention that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization, which essentially means that we neither support nor oppose any political party or any political candidate. The mission of the League is to increase informed and active participation of citizens in government. It is to increase the knowledge of people on major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. And that is precisely the reason we hold these forums, because we want the community members to be engaged and to be informed and to get their answers to any questions that they have on major public policy issues. And uh, as I said, this evening we have gathered regarding gun violence, what can be done. There are those who believe that this is a complex problem and the solution is also very complex. And then there are those who feel that it is not such a complex problem and the solution is really blindingly simple. So, you know, there are extremes, uh, uh, responses to the, can this problem be solved? And we have gathered an expert panel with expertise in different areas. Of course, we could not cover all the areas, but we have tried to limit ourselves to the, you know, uh, five panelists, and we will try to find out from them, based on their experience and expertise, what are the possible solutions. And as the title says, we want to focus more on the solutions than on the problem. What is it that we can do? Now, in the league tradition, there will be plenty of opportunity for all of you to ask questions, because we believe, as I said, in getting the answers for you, so there are index cards available for you to write your questions down. You could have either picked up the index cards before the program started, or if you didn't, there are index cards. You just raise your hand. A volunteer will come and give you the index card and the pens, and you can write your question. Someone will come take it from you, and there are two league members who are from the program committee who are sitting here. They will screen the questions only to consolidate similar questions or to rephrase the question so that the question you know, makes sense. Now, the only criteria for a question is that it has to be brief, succinct, and it should end with a question mark. We are not looking for comments or remarks or anything like that. You know, we just want the question so that they can be answered. And if they are short questions, we can entertain more questions rather than, you know, long questions. The bios of the panelists, is, uh, they are included in your program as an insert. So we are not going to take the time to introduce the panelists and give their bios. Of course, the moderator will be introducing the panelists, but we are not going to go through the bios. I will invite Evelyn Bonavita, who is the Vice President for Programs and also is the Chair for the Program Committee. And the Program Committee is the one that has organized this panel discussion. And I'm really thankful for them, uh, to them for you know, getting these expert panels on this such important topic. So Evelyn will introduce the moderator, and then we will start with the program. Thank you very much. Charlie Gonzalez, who is our moderator tonight, was elected seven times to Congress by the voters of District 20, which was the district of his father, and I'm sure he has his father mentioned at every turn, the legendary Henry B. Gonzalez. However, Charlie's serving as congressman was only the culmination of a career devoted to public service in Bear County. Charlie has been a teacher, a lawyer, and served as a Bear County judge, as well as a district judge. He earned his law degree from St. Mary's School of Law, and when his father retired in 1997, Charlie resigned his judgeship to campaign for his father's seat. He faced a crowded field in the Democratic primary, 
won the nomination in a runoff, and went on to capture the congressional seat by nearly 30 percent. He had little competition from then on in succeeding elections. He is now in private practice as an attorney. Welcome, Charlie, and thank you for being our moderator. Evelyn, thank you very much. Every time they say uh, seven elections and such, I go, what was I thinking? But anyway, <laughs> it was a great honor. It was incredible. Uh, <clears throat> and a, kind of a point of a personal privilege, anyone that runs for office uh, assume such a responsibility, um, and yet it's, it's worth running for office, otherwise you wouldn't do it. So I'd like to introduce a couple of elected officials, or former elected, one former elected official and one present. Uh, and I, the first is Judge Rosie Gonzalez. <clears throat> former city councilman, Ray Lopez. <clears throat> And if I miss any, anyone else, uh, as time goes on, these become more and more important, but either I can read or I can't see from a distance. It's a great honor tonight to, to moderate, uh, and with the work of the League uh, is just so greatly appreciated by this city and, and should be for the obvious reasons. Uh, tonight, of course, we're looking for solutions, uh, even though we know getting there is not the easiest thing in the world. And this is about gun violence, of course. And we've become accustomed to the reaction by government officials, civic and religious leaders, and the general public following a mass or high profile shooting. The refrain will always be, we must do something. But reaching a consensus as to what to do seems to elude us and continues to elude us as I speak. Now we would all be hard pressed to find anyone that would disagree that gun violence is a major health and safety threat to our communities. Well, what is it that we must do? Tonight, the League of Women Voters of, of the San Antonio area has assembled a panel of individuals who come from professions from which key people in these professions have to take a very active role if we're ever going to find those solutions and will be playing key roles. Allow me to uh, introduce the panelists uh, quickly, and it's already uh, been instructed that their full bios are in the programs, I believe, and so if you want to know more about them, <clears throat> read about them and talk to them after the presentation. Uh, to my right, we have Al Kaufman, who is a professor of law at St. Mary's School of Law. We have, uh, let's go, it's uh, Dr. Stephen Plesky, who is professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. And then we have the Reverend Anna Gordy, pastor of Abiding Presence Lutheran Church. And then we have the Honorable Jose Menendez, who is our state senator from District 26. And of course, we have our Bear County Sheriff, Javier Salazar. Each panelist will be given 10 minutes for an opening statement, which will cover their suggested solutions to this major challenge, taking into account, of course, their particular expertise and experience in their chosen field. Now, we do have a timekeeper, and this is for the benefit of the panelists, and yours truly. We have a timekeeper to help us keep on schedule. Where do we have our timekeeper? And so oh, you've got the signs. It's always wonderful. So we're going to go start off to my right. Let's go ahead and start with uh, Al Kaufman, professor of law. I'm a boring law professor, so I'll try to somehow keep you awake anyway. <laughs> um, my major point is to talk about the law in this area, the Second Amendment law. Uh, when the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, uh, found in a case in 2008 that there was an individual right to bear arms guaranteed in the United States Constitution, it was the first time the Supreme Court had ever found that. So this right was apparently in the Constitution it was in, okay, excuse me, I apologize. Uh, it was in the Constitution, but it was not discovered until 2008. Uh, now, that opinion was a 5-4 decision. So what I really want to share with you is just talking about how far that decision went and what it did not say. I think it has been 
uh, misstated and uh, abused, really, by saying that therefore, because the U.S. Supreme Court supported the Second Amendment, that the Second Amendment gives me a right to carry any arm that I want at any place at any time. And it's very clear the Supreme Court did not say that. And they limited it many ways. And I just want to point that out as far as the sort of the legal uh, limits on what we can do and what we can't do. Um, the, the Supreme Court said that clearly uh, Congress or state legislatures or local legislatures can control who can obtain guns. They can make sure that people with mental illness or people with uh, 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 spousal abuse orders against them uh, cannot obtain guns. And that is certainly within the constitutional rights. That, In other words, those persons do not have a Second Amendment right to have a gun to overrule what a public body has said. Also, the Supreme Court said there are limits on what sorts of guns can be carried. Now, you know, you get into funny things about the Constitution. It, you know, the Second Amendment was passed in 1791, and needless to say, there were not Uzis uh, at the time or Saturday night specials. But they said the Second Amendment was passed only to allow someone to have guns for self-defense of the home. That was the limitation on the Second Amendment, the way they classified it. So specifically, the Second Amendment does not give someone the right to carry uh, a submachine gun, a machine gun, uh, uh, a bazooka, uh, a high, uh, a, a one, 100 uh, clip uh, you know, attached to their regular gun. Uh, there are limits on what can be done. Now, I want to make it clear, though. The, the Supreme Court and the, the law has not said the exact what is the proper way to pass a bill or what is the proper way for us to try to come up with some solution. I just want to make sure that when people discuss these issues, they don't say, you can't do that because you're violating my Second Amendment rights or my Second Amendment right allows me to do anything I want with the guns. Uh, so I just want to make sure that's clear. So that's my major point is to talk about what the Supreme Court has said and what it hasn't. Now, these issues have also come up with courts of appeals. You know, there's 11 courts of appeals in the United States. We're in the Fifth Circuit. They're, they're all over the country. And every one of the courts of appeals has limited uh, the use of guns. In other words, they have supported local and state efforts to control guns. Now, uh, they, there are some limits. One state said that you can't carry a stun gun. And the Supreme Court said, well, you know, the Second Amendment really doesn't allow that sort of bill. So if people want to carry stun guns, they're not regular guns, we'll allow that. Uh, but the, the other, quite a few of the courts of appeals have gone into great detail talking about the dangers of AR-15s, the, the dangers of bump stocks, the dangers of clips that carry 20, 50, or 100 rounds. Uh, so the courts have upheld state and local efforts to control that sort of gun and that sort of uh, ammunition. So that's my major point, and I look forward to having the rest of the discussion. Uh, I really feel wonderful. It's a great uh, group of co-panelists. I'm looking forward to hearing them. Dr. Plesky? So uh, I'm chair of the psychiatry department at UT uh, Health Science Center, and uh, we are affiliated with a lot of agencies in town that deal with mental health. Uh, particularly University Hospital through its emergency. Oh, sorry. Uh, particularly through, can you hear me? Is that better? Okay. <clears throat> so we're affiliated with numerous agencies through, through, throughout San Antonio and Bear County. Uh, <clears throat> University Hospital, we have a lot of seriously mentally ill people come into our emergency room. Uh, <clears throat> we work with the Center for Healthcare Services that operates the uh, crisis unit downtown. Uh, there's also been in Bear County over the last uh, several years a major initiative with both uh, emergency medical services and law enforcement so that when the police uh, come in contact with someone who's very uh, disturbed who may present a danger, they are taken to uh, a local psychiatric facility or a uh, uh, emergency room to be evaluated. And I might now can comment on this as if I get it wrong, but there's a very specific set of laws that deal with uh, involuntary uh, uh, commitment for psychiatric services. So if a, a peace officer, a law enforcement officer comes in, in contact with somebody they believe to be mentally ill or 
that uh, is exhibiting mental illness, they can do what's called an emergency detention uh, where they can bring them to a facility to be evaluated, and that generally is 24 to 48 hours. And then uh, a physician, uh, although it's usually a psychiatrist, evaluates that individual at that point, and then a decision is made as to whether the person needs involuntary commitment, and that in Texas is called an order of protective custody. So that is filed, that goes to the judge, and then there's a hearing held, and the judge decides, uh, yes, the person needs to stay in the hospital versus no, they can leave. And then subsequent to that, there's a second hearing if the patient is then refusing treatment, refusing medication. The, uh, the judge, we go back, the psychiatrist will go back to the court and say, you know, this individual is not taking their medicine, they're not getting better, and then the judge can order uh, what's called a compel medication order that then the person is, is given medication, usually antipsychotic medication. Jeez, it's a practically eating the thing. Uh, the, uh, the, then the, uh, uh, the judge can order uh, the medication. And typically, uh, this is antipsychotic medication, and in typical cases it will take, you know, several days to a couple weeks to reach its full effect. When the patient uh, becomes stabilized, then the psychiatrist can go back to the court and say, okay, this person's ready to leave. The order can be dropped, and, and then they can leave. Now, there is, I think, among the general pop population, uh, a huge misconception about psychiatric hospitalization. I think many people still believe we're back in the days of the 19th century or the early 20th century, that when people were committed, they, quote, you know, go to SASH or they go to South Pressa and they stay there for a very extended period of time. Well, San Antonio State Hospital obviously still exists. Uh, it today has about 300 beds. Uh, for example, back in, uh, in the 1960s, it had 3,500 beds. So that gives you an idea of the difference between the way we treat mental illness now and the way it was done back then. Uh, once people get to SASH, it's the same rule, basically. Uh, once a patient is stable, and is no longer a danger to themselves or others, they can be discharged. Now, there are patients at SASH that are so severe that they never recover to that point. And they may be there for years and years. And as a result, there's an extreme shortage uh, of these beds, or there can be a long waiting list to get into them. As a result, most patients with chronic mental illness tend to be on a cycle where there's an ED, they're committed to a short-term hospital like Laurel Ridge or Nick's or University Hospital, they'll stay there for two weeks or so and then they're discharged. Uh, while they're referred for outpatient treatment, uh, they don't go to that outpatient treatment. So invariably they uh, go off their medication, uh, they may, if they have a substance abuse problem, they'll begin to use drugs again, and they then have another crisis. And it's not unusual to see patients who may have five to ten hospitalizations a year. So th this is really the core of the problem in terms of dealing with uh, violence among the mentally ill. Now, it's always important to bear in mind that only a small proportion of people with mental illness are violent to the point that they're dangerous to others. For most part, seriously mentally ill people are mainly a danger to themselves. So a man who's psychotic and believes that the CIA is uh, uh, injecting him with something says, you know, I'm not going to go live at the Haven for Hope or I'm not going to stay in my apartment because the CIA is trying to get me. He's going to go out and live on the street or he's going to be wandering up and down the street uh, saying nonsensical things that frighten people all around him. Uh, <clears throat> the, but some, a, a subset uh, will become uh, violent. Most of those people, tragically, usually are violent toward their family members with whom they live. So it's parents and spouses that are calling the police and saying, you know, my, my uncle's off his meds, he's beaten up my aunt, and the police have to come and do the ED, and the whole uh, cycle begins again. Now, when we get to these major tragedies where there are mass shootings, it becomes a very difficult situation. If we look at some of the recent events, uh, Let's take the uh, shooting in Aurora, Colorado by, by James Holm or the Sandy Hook shooting uh, by uh, Adam Lanza. These two individuals were clearly identified now or we believe that they had severe mental illness. So uh, um, uh, Holmes was definitely had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and appeared to be psychotic. In fact, you can look at pictures of him in his trial and I think even the layman would say, 
boy, there's really something wrong there. Uh, uh, Lanza himself, too, had a long history of mental illness, although he was out of treatment for a very extended period of time and just living at home with his mother, and he, he clearly seemed to have been in a psychotic state when he did what he, what he did. Now, uh, in other cases, uh, such as the recent uh, problem in, uh, recent event in, in Sutherland Springs, you have another kind of profile of an individual who's likely to do this. This generally a male, uh, usually either single or uh, a relationship is broken down, very angry at the world around them, sometimes has a substance abuse problem, has always had a history of being very impulsive and easily angered, and then something snaps and they take a weapon and then, then, then commit some grievous act. Uh, other people like uh, Dylan Roof, who did the uh, church shooting in South Carolina, seems to fall in the gray area. Some, some experts who examined him said, well, he, he might have had some autism, he might have had some Asperger's. Uh, but really, violence is not a feature necessarily of autism or Asperger's, so that really doesn't fit together. And curiously, Dylan Roof himself went through a lot of trouble to refuse to be evaluated by experts or plead insanity uh, because he saw what he did as an, as an ideological act. And then uh, finally we have the fellow in, in Las Vegas who did that terrible shooting. He appeared to fit none of the profiles we have. He was in a relationship, he was financially uh, successful, he didn't have any history of posting strange things on, on the internet. Uh, so. Studies that have been done show that acts of violence uh, committed by uh, people with serious mental illness perhaps account for about 4% of the violent crimes. So that means if we could cure bipolar and schizophrenia tomorrow, uh, that certainly would, well obviously that'd be a great thing for the victims of those diseases, and we would maybe reduce violent crime by about 4%, which would mean a lot to those people. Uh, but uh, wouldn't necessarily uh, cut down the, the broad range of violence that, that occurs in our society. Uh, so I think the, uh, some of the, it, it's also important to note that, that psychiatric, mental health professionals do not have any reliable way to predict what individual patient is going to commit one of these grievous acts in the future. So over the years I've treated uh, many patients with violent tendencies. And uh, the, uh, and there are these people I've worried about and thought to myself, oh, this person's gonna end up on the news. Uh, I'm really, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm very pessimistic about the outcome. But very few of those people ever actually committed a violent act. Uh, the, uh, uh, so the role, I, I think where the role of mental health comes in is looking at the chronically mentally ill and optimizing their treatment so that a whole range of negative outcomes are uh, avoided. And in that, we will prevent some tr tr violent tragedies, but we can't look to the mental health system to be uh, a method that can prevent all of these tragedies. Reverend Gordy. So I'm a pastor, and uh, I brought a sermon. <laughs> I'm only kind of kidding. Um, I went to undergrad school at Texas Lutheran University, and in December of 1994, I was held at gunpoint and later shot. Um, that was just a few months after my denominational body had issued a statement about gun violence, and all these years, all these years later, I am so sorry. So all of these years later, things have still not changed. Um, I read an article when I was preparing for this event um, by Sean Gregory and Chris Wilson of Time Magazine. It's a thoughtful piece in March of last year entitled, Six Real Ways We Can Reduce Gun Violence in America. They state that any sensible discussion about America's gun violence problem must acknowledge that guns are not going away, and clearly that's true. No matter one's personal emotional response to guns, they are coded into our laws, they are written into our constitution, and with the diversity of thought about them, it, they're not going away anytime soon. The authors go on to advocate practical solutions that intervene in a variety of areas of public life, from effective gun laws to smart gun technology, the inclusion of the export, expertise and reach of the medical community. Again, I encourage you to read it. Um, their ideas do have merit. And also, 
I think that we have to have a real hard, honest conversation in our society about rage and hate and race and religion. I'm a pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. According to a Pew Research study in 2015, my denomination is the second whitest denomination in the United States. Our congregations have presided over the religious education of Dylan Klebold, who co-orchestrated the mass murder at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, over the education, the religious education of Dylan Roof, who murdered nine at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and Devin Patrick, who murdered 26 at First Baptist Church just down the road in Sutherland Springs, Texas. I would be remiss as a pastor in my denomination if I did not draw a clear line between the whiteness of those men, the hatred in their hearts, and the horror that they manufactured, and our culpability as religious leaders. The lives that they wasted, the fear that they generated. See, I think that gun violence is an indicator and an evil symptom of a much larger national problem. Now, it's true that religion is declining in this country, particularly among mainline Christian denominations, and I don't think that's necessarily a problem, although it does affect my job security. It's still largely a nation where folks are members of religious institutions or are served by religious organizations, and I think that religious leaders are missing an opportunity to help heal this nation by not talking explicitly about race and gun violence in our religious studies and in our worship services. Because at the heart of each episode of intentional gun violence is hate. From suicide to domestic violence to gang violence to mass murders, we've become a nation that's so grounded in fear and hatred that we can't see how to solve problems without some kind of violence. Our public discourse and embarrassingly to me, our religious discourse focuses on who's in and who's out, who are the haves and who are the have-nots. The divisions among us are no surprise. The nation was founded on a bedrock of racism and genocide and slavery, and religion, particularly white Christianity, has perverted scripture to uphold that system. From the doctrine of discovery to the American Indian reservation system, from slavery to Jim Crow laws and racially biased drug laws, we have soldered into the structure of our society ways to keep one group of people in power and we've underscored it with the name of God. We have not yet reckoned with that reality. I'm willing to bet that there are folks who will argue with me that that's not the reality, and I will thank them for proving my point. In 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. said that we must face the fact that in America, the church is still the most segregated major institution in America. At 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, when we stand and sing and Christ has no east or west, we stand at the most segregated hour in this nation. This is tragic. And it is tragic. But even beyond Christianity, in 2019, we still segregate ourselves by gender, by sexuality, by race, by religion, by socioeconomic status. And then we resent one another, and we fear one another, and then we hate one another, and if a gun is handy, then we kill one another. Or, if the loathing is turned inward, we kill ourselves. Not a single major world religion calls for violence against one another. Not even the satanic temple, y'all. But every single major world religion has some form of what Christians and others, others call the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Laws and restrictions and practical interventions on the ownership and usage of guns is critical, but they only treat the symptom. We must begin from early childhood, from infancy even, to educate our children about the diversity and goodness of God's good creation. We have to begin to help one another see that each person is valuable, not because they are our brother or sister or neighbor as though we have a claim over them, but because they are our they are their own uniquely embodied self, made in the shadow of God's image, made with a spark of the, of the divine. Mother Teresa said that if we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten that we belong to one another. Our job as religious leaders, as community leaders, 
and as citizens is to remind one another of that and to teach our children. If we were in church, I'd say amen. Okay. Setter Menendez. So, uh, uh, Reverend Gordy, I need to find out where your church is. I, <laughs> I, uh, I was very impressed by that. And uh, it's rare that I'm surprised or impressed or that I hear such, uh, such truth, such plain spoken truth. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I want to say thank you to all of you for... Uh, taking time out of your schedules to be here tonight. I want to say thank you to the League of Women Voters for doing this. Um, you know, today's been an interesting day. This week's been an interesting week. We've, uh, we're into our third week of the legislative session, 86th le legislative session. Can You can't hear in the back. No. These things are, uh, let me, you know, we're gonna, let, me, let me use the other one. Yeah, you have to hold it real close. I'm not a fan of these things. Is that better? Okay. So, uh, good evening. My name is Jose Menendez. I have the honor and privilege of being the senator for District 26 here in San Antonio. Uh, we're in our third week of the uh, uh, 86th legislative session. And so, uh, which, what that means is that uh, I can't tell you how many, what day this is of my four-hour commute up and back. Uh, and, uh, but it's okay. It's, it, it allows me an opportunity to take my, my, our children to school and uh, walk the dog and get uh, grounded every day as I leave for Austin, Texas uh, before I get to meet with all of the, the folks from around the state on the issues we want to talk about. You know, I was doing a little research and uh, the f sad fact is that uh, the Washington Post reported in 2017 that through a Gallup poll, they found that there are 393 million guns distributed through 50 million households across the United States. So there is absolutely no way that, as you said, that we're just going to find a way to just get rid of them, okay? So then I think what you've said is absolutely right. And for those of you who don't know, Dr. Stephen Pliska is, is a foremost authority in behavioral and psychological issues with juveniles and others. I mean, he is, he is an expert and we're very fortunate to have him here. So, taking this very sad situation into consideration that we're facing as a nation, uh, knowing the tragedies that we, we've experienced, you know, whether you think about Sutherland Springs in 2017, where 26 adults and children were killed and wounded while they were in church. Yesterday, we, uh, we honored uh, the hero who stopped the shooter, uh, who happened to be in his boxer shorts in his house across the street from the church when he heard the firing and threw on some jeans and went out barefoot and yelled. And he just yelled. And the shooter came out uh, of the church and they started uh, having a gunfight in the middle of the street as he leaned over his pickup truck. For those of you who don't know, he's a plumber. He's a plumber at University Hospital. He's a very humble man uh, who didn't want any of this attention but thank God he was where he was. You know, our schools, and, my, and, and I hope many of you would agree, should be places where our future leaders are taught and nurtured. I think uh, we shouldn't have to fear that our children are going to have to experience what the kids did in Santa Fe, where that 17-year-old killed 10 and injured 13 others. And then last week, we had a 12-year-old uh, shoot a 24-year-old when he was taken in. You know, obviously, we're all here because we believe the bloodshed must stop. So we have to figure out some workable solutions to try to prevent uh, the senseless damage and the loss of life. As we learned from uh, brilliant law professor Al Kaufman, people have a right to arm themselves. But that same principle that founded our nation also declared that we had certain inalienable rights that are among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I, and I believe that my rights end when I start to infringe on your rights. And so I think we need to take that into consideration. I think controlling the problem does not mean that we deprive anyone of their right to lawfully own a firearm. And so this is why I'm reaching out to those of you 
and my other constituents who are tired of being confronted by what seems to be a series of injustices. Uh, I believe there are many of us who wish to stand together rather than stand against one another. And to those of us who understand the value of love to, use, to be used as a tool for growth, therefore I believe it's imperative that we come together in order to ensure that the safety and the prosperity of all human beings. I believe the expectation of safety from gun violence is not and should ever be considered a partisan issue. These are not partisan issues, and unfortunately, it's become that. I think this is an issue of protecting human rights, and more importantly, the protection of human lives. Gun violence has affected every part of our country, and today, unlike when we, many of us, were children, parents and families have to worry whether their kids and loved ones will come back home from school, the grocery store, public events, and even prayer services. And I don't know about you, but I actually think a little bit more about when I go to large public events. And it saddens me to worry about, and, and, I, and I had a friend who, when we went to the, it, I thought of all places, we were at the MLK march just recently, and I, I went to pat him, and I, and I felt, it wasn't you, but I felt the bulletproof vest. You know, I expect you to wear it. Yeah, no, I, I know. I was a little surprised that you're not wearing it. But, but I'm just like, wow. He, he, he felt like he had to wear the bulletproof vest, and I'm like, this is, this is sad. And so rather than be crippled by fear, I think we need to be proactive. And that's what was so exciting about your sermon, which made me want to go hear more. Um, after the Santa Fe shooting, uh, the Senate had a select committee and the governor gathered people to have forums in Austin. Uh, I heard what happened and therefore I decided to have our own school safety forum in September at UTSA. Uh, I feel that on the issue of gun violence, we can all share our personal ideas and experiences. I think that we have school systems here in San Antonio, parents, administrators that have a good idea on what will and won't work. I, for one, don't think that arming teachers and putting more guns into the schools is a good solution. You know, I just... <laughs> I understand that for many Texans, uh, we value the right to own a gun, you know, and possess it lawfully. But we, and we know we're not going to change the culture, and we're not trying to change the culture. You know, that's the thing that we all have to talk about. But I think it's important that we also believe that, that gun ownership is a responsibility. Just like any responsibility that allows for uh, driving a car, for example. It's a vehicle that can be used as a weapon. Therefore, we make people take a license, take a test, show proficiency, and obey certain laws. We should have the same exact situation uh, when it comes to owning our guns. Our goal needs to be able to pass common sense legislation that reduces harm, injury, and death. It's good to see my friend Ray Lopez and his beautiful wife, Evelyn. Uh, uh, with the fact that you're running for the state, uh, you could be in uh, many other places. Thank you for being here learning about this important issue. If the Second Amendment advocates are concerned with the mixing of mental health and firearms, then they should support measures that keep the firearms out of the hands of people who are not stable. If that's the issue, if they want to say, you're trying to take the guns, then support us, work with us. I have other bills that, that make sense to me that says, if you are too dangerous to fly, we have a federal list of people that they, they suspect they shouldn't, that we can't sell them a plane ticket. Well, then I think you shouldn't be able to buy a gun. And, and I still can't get that bill passed. I think we must resist the rights or the, the, the decision of many people trying to box us into either you're pro-Second Amendment or you're against Second Amendment. No, we're, we don't have to be in that box. We can be smarter than this. And so there's a third way. Let's protect Texans in a balanced fashion. And so think, I, I think that the gun politics is a, obviously a divisive issue, but we have to get people to cross that divide. So as a senator, I look for ways to get my constituents input and, and to find out how we can shape an agenda that works at well and tries to reduce the tension and the divisiveness, but instead we need to invest the energy to come together to resolve the fears and the uncertainties through shared ideas and solutions. 30 seconds, I got it. So, it's a, so that's why it's a priority for me. 
uh, let's stop the dev drawing divisive lines and let's look for the ways to, to get the most interest to protect our most vulnerable. I look forward to listening to all of you. I want you to know that you all are welcome to come and listen to us. We have plenty of time in this legislative session. I'd love to see you, many of you here in Austin testifying if we get the ability to, to present bills. Because I think we do need to have bills like the red flag bills that say, if you're a danger to yourself or others, then you shouldn't have access to your gun. You know, and I think that's important. So, well, I'm, I'm going to respect the time. And uh, let's see what we can do to learn tonight how we can make things better. Sheriff, it's all you. Thank you all so much. I'm Sheriff Javier Salazar. And as you may know, uh, my family in blue was just recently touched by gun violence in a very very personal way. Um, I lead an agency of uh, 1,500 deputies, uh, sworn deputies, about 300 civilians, uh, six horses, and nine dogs uh, that I'm responsible for all of them. And one of our dogs, Canine Chucky, lost his life the other night uh, to a person who absolutely is the poster child for somebody that should not own a weapon. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, very recently, a resident of Huntsville, um, and a long rap sheet that includes family violence, uh, aggravated assault, um, evading arrest, just totally the, the poster child for somebody that should not have a gun, and yet he did. Uh, and that night he saw fit to endanger thousands of, of people on the highways, uh, dozens of first responders, and ultimately took the life of, of one of my uh, deputies in a very, very harsh way. Um, I can tell you that's the, I've had many friends die over the years from gun violence as a, as a first responder. I've been, a, I've been a first responder for going on 27 years, and um, this was my first deputy under my command that I lost, and it certainly doesn't make it any easier that that deputy had four legs. Um, so look, my, my perspective uh, on, on gun violence uh, and, and what we should all be doing is everything within each one of our power is what we need to be doing, everything. Uh, if you're a parent, you have something that you have a role to play. If you're a teacher, a member of the clergy, uh, a business owner, you have a responsibility to, to do everything in your power to keep the guns out of the hands of people that just flat out do not, uh, should not have them. So my role in law enforcement uh, goes well beyond enforcing the law. Uh, I have other responsibilities that I take equally as important. Um, educating the public. Uh, I, I, we, we spend quite a bit of time educating the public, and I'll tell you about how. Uh, also preventing crime from happening in the first place is one of the things we spend quite a bit of time on, but also studying. I spend quite a bit of time, and I have uh, officers whose sole purpose it is, is to go study uh, incidents that happen in other parts of the country and bring that knowledge back and dissect it to see how better we can, we can protect our county here by preventing atrocities like what happened in other parts of the country or even the world here in Bear County. So let me tell you about some of the things that we're doing at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, and many of them are new programs that, that we just started uh, since taking office about two years ago. So one of the first things that we do, one of the most important things that we do is we do quite a bit of public training. Uh, we do a lot of active shooter training for the community. It's free training that we offer to churches, neighborhood associations, places of business. Uh, our deputies will come out and teach a class uh, for you free of charge, and it's great information. They keep it entertaining. I've got some great deputies that are, that are very good instructors. They keep the class engaged, and they keep the plan simple. Uh, look, in any one of these active shooter situations that we've seen in the country, the weapon of choice of these guys is, is almost secondary. It could be a rifle, a shotgun, a handgun, a truck full of fertilizer, a rental pickup. That's almost secondary to the number one tool that they seek to use against us, and that's our mind. If they can create a sense of panic in our mind, then they've got us. They've got us, and, and they, we, they put us into a blind panic, and then they can walk around picking their targets at leisure. So through information that like we provide at, at, through our active shooter training, we keep our plan simple, avoid, deny, defend. And we give you the information that you'll need to react calmly and coolly in a situation and to keep yourself and others alive until such time as we get there or even better yet, end the threat before we get there. Uh, one of the other things that we're doing is, is from the enforcement perspective. Uh, we are involved in the Violent Crimes Task Force with the San Antonio Police Department, the DPS. Those were the three main agencies that started this. When I took office, uh, I got a call from, from uh, a friend of mine uh, named Bill McManus that called me and says, hey, uh, you want to you wanna partner up now that you're the sheriff? You know, I worked for him for many years. So we, uh, we partnered up on the Violent Crimes Task Force. We partnered my street crimes deputies uh, with his street crimes officers and a couple of undercovers, and we just set about 
uh, going to the spots on the map that are red and working them uh, aggressively and, and arresting violent felons until the map wasn't red anymore. It was green. And then we'd move on to the next red spot. So look, we've succeeded in that endeavor so much so that it's, it's, been, it's, it's taken, it's a snowball effect. DPS has jumped in and DPS just added another 50 troopers to the, to the uh, mix. Uh, but all of the alphabet soup uh, federal agencies have jumped on board, the FBI, the DEA, um, everybody's got, got uh, uh, some, some skin in the game. And so we're working together very hard to get guns off the street. Uh, one of the other things that we've done recently, it's a pretty innovative program, I think. Uh, so I have a, a group of deputies at my agency that are reservists. Reserve deputies have a 40-hour job somewhere else. They're real estate agents, lawyers, doctors, educators, but they hold a peace officer license. And in order for me to hold their reserve uh, license, they have to donate 16 hours of law enforcement time every month to the, to the taxpayers of Bear County. Now, traditionally, they have done that on patrol. Uh, but we recently started using them. I said, why not, why not put them in a school? And so we started a pilot program with uh, Southside ISD, no, Southwest ISD and East Central ISD where we put reserve deputies in the schools. Um, truth be told, some of the deputies are doing more than their 16 hours a month because they, they truly enjoy interacting with the kids. And it gives the, the uh, schools a peace, peace of mind uh, to have a, a, a deputy free of charge, no charge to the taxpayers, uh, hanging out with the kids and providing that extra layer of security. We're very soon going to open that up to churches, Pastor, uh, and private schools. Uh, it, you know, once because because it did go so well. So some of the other things that we're doing uh, here recently, uh, well, not so recently anymore. I partnered with an organization called uh, Moms Demand Action, and when I say I partnered, they came to my office and bullied me into doing something. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They came to my office and simply asked if I would be willing to revise uh, my policy with regard to uh, disarming family violence suspects. It was a compelling argument. I didn't even let them get the, the, the question out before I answered yes. And, and so I think that next day we changed our policy. Uh, and so what we do, and it's really quite simple, other agencies are doing it across the country. We just came along with it. Um, that if you, uh, if, if on a family violence incident, we tell the officers, if you are able to get a search warrant to seize those guns, then do so. Um, if you can't get a warrant, if, it, if the circumstances just aren't there, simply ask, can we take these guns with us? And a lot of the times, you'd be surprised. They'll give their guns up, and, and you know, they'll have to come down and get them from the property room later on down the road. But we've, that's, that's one less gun that's out there for that night, at least, or until they come down to get it. And so I, I certainly thank the Moms Demand Action for coming down and, and uh, seeing to it that, that they held my feet to the fire, and I did it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm married to a, to a mom, a demanding mom. So, of course, <laughs> I'd have been a sucker not to do that. Um, but let me see. Some of the other things that we're doing, of course, is, is we stay very involved in the legislature. I've got an intergovernmental uh, relations specialist that we just brought onto the sheriff's office, and his job is to, well, among many other jobs that I have him doing, uh, is he monitors what's going on in the legislature. He monitors bills for us and certainly keeps me in touch with, with uh, my legislative uh, or my legislators. And so if they do need me to come down and testify on anything, I'm a phone call away. Um, and we, we certainly, I'm, I'm, I can be there in 45 minutes uh, in Austin, uh, the way I drive, uh, 40, 40 minutes uh, for, for certain. But look, it's one of the things that we're proud to do, uh, everything that we can uh, here in, in, in San Antonio. And I can tell you, from it, as we, since we've been concentrating so much on not just law enforcement, but public education, uh, crime overall is down about 8.5% in Bear County uh, over last year. Uh, so I think that we're doing a great job, and, and, and I certainly realize that we can always do more. So I'm always looking to, to do more. Um, if any of y'all have, uh, have an organization that we can partner with to do something to positively affect crime, again, I'm a phone call away, and we'll be here after, the, uh, after this forum for sure. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you to each member of the, uh, the panel. I'm hoping that the audience is filling out those cards with questions. I don't know if we have any at this time, but I get to uh, ask the first one, and uh, members of the panel, you only have two minutes. And so my question to, be, uh, to you, to each of you, uh, the statements that you've made are pretty much obviously come from your own experience, your livelihood, what you do. So from your respective uh, positions and such, if you could do just one act, um, one change, one law to reduce gun violence, what would it be? 
And you're going to get it, by the way. I mean, this is not just a wish list, but uh, Senator Menendez is going to go back to Austin and get it for us. So it doesn't have to be a law. I'm talking because I know the Reverend had something that was outside the scope of the law. Al, what would you wish for? I would uh, definitely want to limit any sort of high-capacity magazines and semi-automatic and automatic rifle sales. Dr. Pleska? Well, from, a, from a mental health perspective, I think the red flag laws are very critical. Uh, right now, people who actually... Un if you have to hold yeah. it real close, almost... Um, to <clears throat> the, uh, from, a mental, from a mental health perspective, uh, the uh, red flag laws or expanded red flag laws are very critical. So people who've been committed formally to a state hospital uh, I, you know, go on the list where they can't have weapons, but probably people who have uh, have un have had an emergency detention for some kind of mental health issue. Uh, there could be a system where uh, the the uh, mental health professionals in the hospital, even if that person doesn't go forward to commitment, that they also could be put on such a list. Uh, I I think the, uh, the the other thing I would look at again not it would indirectly uh, prevent violence, not just gun violence, but a range of different violence if we could keep people who come out of the hospital in active treatment. Uh, Texas has a legal procedure called uh, assisted outpatient treatment, that when people leave the hospital, they can be committed to stay in outpatient treatment, but uh, they can't be compelled to stay on their medication, which is often the most critical component, and often the infrastructure to support the outpatient component is, is not always there. So a person has an order to go to their clinic, but if they don't show up, there have to be enough caseworkers and people to be able to respond to go find that, that individual and bring them in. I think I told you my wish list already, but to be super clear about it, I would wish that every religious institution and the people, for, the people who are responsible for it would take time to educate one another about people of other faiths um, and people of other um, backgrounds and cultures so that we have a clear understanding of who one another are and in that way can call each other beloved, eradicate hate, and eliminate um, the need for violence. Uh, you know, some faiths call for the elimination of prejudice, and they talk about that humanity is only going to work when men and women are like the two wings of a bird and they're equal, that that's the only way we're going to be able to work. And so there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. I would like to hear or feel that if, you know, it's funny, Charlie, Charlie can, he's always been a very funny guy, but it would be great if when I went to Austin, we wouldn't have defensive positions on where we were. And maybe if we could somehow eliminate all of the, the, the special interest groups that are hovering over people, causing them to fear taking a vote for something that might be common sense legislation. Then this red flag laws, everybody would say, well, heck, that makes a lot of sense. And, and let's, let's go ahead and push that. Let's go ahead and do something because I think that, like in the case where you're talking about domestic violence, my understanding is that from my friends in law enforcement that a domestic violence call is one of the ones that you fear the most because you know it's a charged environment, you know there might be weapons, and you don't know what's going to happen. So you fear, you're the, the, the law enforcement officers fear for their own lives and the lives of the people in that situation. So, you know, it's, uh, I will tell you this. And I'll, I'll end with this. Last November, the, the elections that occurred last November created a situation where in Austin, Texas, people lost seats in areas they weren't supposed to lose, and people are sitting in areas. So what I've seen at the very top, in certain places in that pink building, there are people who are taking note, and I'll, be, I'll finish up, taking note of the elections, and I think they're worried about what's going to happen in two years, and so I think they're more open. So if we all show up again in the same numbers or more in a year and a half next November, 
I think you're going to find that we can actually move Texas towards a more centrist position, if not. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of, the, of red flag laws as well, if we could come up with a way to do it. I'm not anti-gun. I'm, I'm anti-gun in the, in the wrong hands, for sure. Um, and, and certainly, I, I, look, I think that, that family violence, we've seen a, an upsurge, an uptick in, in family violence, uh, gun, viol uh, gun violence, gun murders. Um, we had several last year. I, I know at least two of the officer-involved shootings that my officers were involved in were uh, in family violence situations. Uh, that, that thankfully, my officers prevailed. Um, in one of those, the, the victim uh, was killed prior to their arrival, and in the other, she certainly would have been killed had they not gotten there and, and taken the swift action that they did. Uh, so I can tell you, uh, I, also having been uh, the first boots on the ground from Bear County at Sutherland Springs. I was actually there that day. Um, that, again, was a family violence situation that just went way, way, way beyond anything that any of us could have, could have imagined. So I think one of, the, one of the biggest ways, and so I'll, I'll turn from the law enforcement criminal side to the civil side. And, and look, I'm by no stretch of the imagination am I a extremely litigious, sue everybody uh, type person. But I can tell you that's how these businesses are probably going to catch on and start taking control of who gets a hold of their guns. Uh, right now, there's a friend of mine, uh, Stanley Bernstein, a, a very uh, talented attorney that's involved in a lawsuit against uh, one of the very big uh, retail uh, outlets uh, in connection with, with Sutherland Springs. He is taking that fight to them because of the way that gun was purchased, uh, sold to somebody who, again, absolutely should not have had, had it and ended up taking so many lives and affecting all of our daily lives on a daily basis. Um, and I think that's the only way these folks are going to catch on is if we hit them in the pocketbook and, and make it sting every time they, they make a stupid decision uh, for the sake of the almighty dollar. That's how we're going to get the results we need. Thank you very much. This is a question from the audience. <clears throat> And I think it goes to what Professor Kaufman alluded to as far as the Supreme Court decisions, and that is if protect the home uh, is the crux of why you have weapons or you're allowed to have firearms, why are we allowing open carry in public domain? Define home. Well, again, what I'm talking about is that the, the Supreme Court says you have a constitutional right to have a handgun in your home. Beyond that, it's all politics. So the, the Supreme Court has not said that Texas could not limit uh, open carry. The Supreme Court has not said that Texas couldn't limit guns in schools or churches or even on the street. All of those are possible laws that the state of Texas or its localities could pass and under general Supreme Court precedent would be upheld. So it's politics. Anyone when it if anyone else has an opinion on this. Real quick, I will say, Professor Coffin, because I looked it up, I hadn't seen it in so long, but when I was in Congress, the assault weapons ban expired. It was a 10-year ban. Couldn't get it going again. So I started just reading a little bit, of course, not real research. You would flunk, he would give me an F on my uh, research, but it was never challenged on Second Amendment grounds. That's what I read. Is that true? Do you know? I think that's right. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That, uh, those things were uh, the 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 Brady Bill was upheld. Other bills were upheld until 2008, when the Supreme Court uh, discovered uh, the Second Amendment rights. But even then, those rights would not have prevented what was in the Brady Bill. The only thing in the Brady Bill that would have been prevented by the Supreme Court would be if you could not have possession of any handgun in your home. Anyone else? All right, this second question here. How do you counteract the uh, negative effect of the Dickey Amendment on the research efforts, gun violence by uh, uh, CDC? And real quick, what I know about the uh, Dickey Amendment, because I served with him, and he has since changed his mind, I believe, and that was a prohibition from uh, the CDC collecting statistics 
uh, regarding gun-related violence. Uh, there really is out there. Uh, that's what members of Congress do. They just restrict the use of funds for programs that they, they don't believe in. I mean, there are many other things, too, as you know. But, uh, Dr. Pliska, what if the CDC kept this information, the statistics? Would it be helpful? How is it helpful? I think it would be very, uh, very helpful, particularly in this era of big data. So um, uh, it could be correlated with other he health statistics to kind of better understand uh, the roots of violence. And uh, so I think, I think repealing that amendment would be, I mean, we look at all kinds of, we look at car, cars, uh, we track car accidents, plane accidents, there's all kinds of other uh, infectious agents, all kinds of other adverse events that uh, we research its, its prevalence in society. It often leads to uh, it often leads to a lot of, uh, of uh, fruitful hypotheses in terms of treatment. So repealing that amendment would be very helpful. We already have information being collected, uh, of course, as the doctor uh, references, regarding other causes, uh, whether it's diseases, accidents, prevention, and such. And all that information that we glean is we use it, but not when it comes to gun violence, which is pretty amazing. But like I said, I think uh, former Representative Dickey actually changed his mind. He said it wasn't such a great idea after all. Uh, of course, he's no longer in Congress, so what does it matter? <clears throat> what do the panel members think about the glamorization of violence, firearm violence uh, in the media that affects our youth directly? We can, well, yeah, I think I'll start with, with Reverend Gordy. I think that's something that you can address. Um, I, I have um, five children, four that came with me into my new marriage and one that I got as a happy aside. Um, and I think about them and the violence that they witness uh, regularly. And so my, there's no real way to shield them from it because if they aren't exposed to it um, by me, then they're going to see it somewhere else. And so my position has been to uh, intentionally expose them to violence in, in ways that I, you know, I know what's coming next, I've seen this movie before, and then to really talk about it and talk about what the uh, ramifications of that might have been beyond the screen, right? What might have happened in these people's stories beyond the screen. Um, in my home, there are no first-person shooter games, um, and there won't be. Um, <laughs> because I think that <coughs> it distorts the perception of reality. Uh, my former spouse um, served in the United States Navy and um, was a, a backseater in an F-14. And so he spent all of his training in simulators and would later go on to say, you know, at some point when, we were, when you're in action and it's real, it's still not real because it's a computer screen. And so that really stuck with me um, and so, and so that's the reason why that doesn't happen in my home. I don't want my children to ever walk into a situation and not understand clearly that the person in front of them is a real person with a real story and real life experiences. Anyone else? Now we know that there's always an opinion and someone has a different opinion and this question goes to where is there going to be common ground? But we know that we have law professors that might disagree with uh, Professor Kaufman. We know we have people from the medical community that believe it's not the business of the medical profession. We even have members or, uh, of, of different uh, religious institutions that will argue for arming individuals. And of course, uh, Senator Menendez every day goes on the floor of the Senate, and there are definitely people with different opinions about that. And Sheriff Salazar's opinions may not be shared by other sheriffs throughout this state. Uh, you know, you've seen the chief of police in Houston uh, very strongly calling for laws. And then, of course, then you'll see a dozen other police uh, chiefs throughout the nation saying that's the wrong thing to do. But the uh, Audience members say, where do we start? What do gun control and gun advocates agree on, if anything? Who wants to take that? Jose? So, <clears throat> it's the only things that I find that we have 
very quick, easy agreement is that obviously we want our schools to be safe. Um, we have different ways of thinking about how we get there. But I, I, I completely think that, that in Austin there are a few things that, that are just, you know, common sense. Our schools need to be safe places. Um, some folks think that that's just a matter of fortifying the buildings, the entrances, the abilities, making them a way where you can lock people in or certain parts. A lot of our schools have already done that. But I think the thing that what I'm trying to get, where I'm trying to get some common agreement to is that many of our shooters, if we already can also agree that the guns are, are, are out there, they're prevalent, they're easily accessible, I think we could probably agree to that. Then the question is, how can we keep the guns out of the hands of the people who shouldn't have them? What can we do? And that's even too uh, sometimes hard. It's, it, that's where we start having disagreement. But then the question is, what can we do to try to get to the root cause of that, of all of those shooters, whether it be Santa Fe or Sullivan or uh, you name it, that something snaps, that they just decide that life is just not worth living within the boundaries that we all live in, and that I don't care. I'm going to go uh, kill those people that made me feel so badly about myself, and then I don't care if I die myself. And I think that's where we need to figure out how do we address that. And so um, I, one of the positive outcomes of this debate has been that there has been a stronger focus on mental health in the state of Texas that I had not seen. You know, I, I started in the Texas legislature in 2001, and when I first got there, we didn't talk much about mental health. And in the years since we've had these issues come up, mental health has come to the forefront, and, and we are doing more. And this session, I believe you're going to see a mental health bill, unlike many, where it's going to try to ask, it's going to try to give resources to the schools when there's that first sign of a student uh, doing something that they can identify. And so we're working hard in that regard, and that is something we can all agree on. Now, there'll be differences in the details of what we agree, um, but, but I think that's that. Wherever we can find common, some common ground, we need to hold on to that and defend it. And, and one of the things I think I also like about Moms Demand Action is that they're very upfront about saying, we're not here to take anybody's guns. We believe in the Second Amendment. And that helps because it seems like everyone's trying to say, you're either for guns or you're against guns. And, and there's scorecards. And it, if you're, we're going to give you a score, and that's how you're going to get you know, you're going to be, everyone that we associate with and that we, we're going to tell them how you should be seen as an as a elected official. That, that's not a good thing because we need elected officials that can f help reach out and find common ground. And, and I think that's what we need to be nurturing. We need to stop trying to put people into little convenient boxes. You're a... You're a this label, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're a liberal, you're a conservative, you're the, hey, 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 can I be a Texan? Can I be an American? Can I be a human being? Can I be someone that, that thinks an independent? You know, can I think for myself? And, and you know, I'm, I'm proud to be a Democrat. I'm, I've been a Democrat, my, but, but I, I don't want to put people in such a tight box that that doesn't let me get like y'all were in Washington where y'all couldn't even hang out with the other people. You know, you couldn't talk to them. And, and I don't know when it happened. I think it was that guy, uh, the exterminator guy from Houston that caused all that stuff, <laughs> that turned congressman, delay. But, but before that, before that, you know, Reagan and Tip O'Neill used to get together for dinner and they'd talk about what they could get agreement on. I will tell you right now, some of the best work that we can get done in Austin is when we get in after a long, tiresome drive or something and we sit down for a cup of coffee at a table and, and it could be three or four colleagues from around the state. They may not be the same party, but we can talk about the family, the kids, the school, how things are going, get to know each other, and then find common ground. And, that, and that's the only way it's going to work. And, and, and so I can't give you a laundry list of things that we agree on, but I can tell you that we just have to 
we need help from the electorate to let people be, you know, how many of y'all can remember that they went after Joe Strauss because he was too moderate? <laughs> okay? Let him represent his district, you know? And he's, he wants to be a Republican because he believes certain things, but he wants to be moderate on certain things. Let him be who he is. But the problem is the electorate is pushing on both sides, and I think it's because special interests are pushing us to the edges, to the end, the fringes. If you're a Democrat, they're trying to purify. You gotta be as liberal as you can. If you're a Republican, you gotta be as you know, conservative as you can. We need common sense voters to say, solve problems. Go out there and work with people to make things work better. Professor Kaufman, I think you, yeah. Professor Kaufman. Mental health issue is very important. I was very impressed by what Dr. Bliska said about the percentage, though, of, of violent crime created by those persons. So I think it is important. I also think it's an excuse for trying to avoid actually controlling the number of guns uh, created, sold in the United States. We're ahead of the whole world on that. So I do think there's some agreement, not everyone, of course, but some agreement that uh, Military weapons, which are clearly military weapons, machine guns, uh, submachine guns, uh, greater uh, guns should not be sold to the public, and they should not be allowed to be held by the public. So be, people disagree with that, but I think that's something that many people would agree with. Anyone else on common ground? Let me ask uh, Reverend uh, Gordy, I was uh, Reverend Gordy. Is there any movement in just San Antonio, let's say in San Antonio, uh, ecumenical, um, I don't want to say, you know, it would take all our religious leaders to come together and give us some direction. It wouldn't have to be specific policy, but that our elected leaders, uh, civic, elected, and so on, have to start taking stands on just something that would be common sense. We just said there are some things that we probably could agree on, the safety of our children in the schools, how we go about doing that, mental health and such. Is there anything that the churches are doing here in San Antonio? Uh, I am not a aware of, of a, a, a church-led group on gun violence. Um, I'm not aware of one either, but I will tell you that the mayor um, appointed Ann Helmke as oh, sure. the liaison to the faith-based initiative, um, and I am uh, a member of the, that working group as the leader for the religious diversity team. We work on the issue of religious discrimination and on loving one another. Um, and some of the things that we talk about are uh, violence and uh, intergenerational poverty and mental health. And so we are starting to have those conversations and connect with one another across religious lines and across ecumenical lines. And so I have great hope if gun violence is something that you're particularly passionate about and you'd like to see the faith-based initiative address that, please do talk with me afterwards and I'd love to connect you with someone who can um, pull you into their working group. That would be great, thank you very much. The next question from the audience. Domestic abuse calls seem to be the most dangerous calls for prospective gun violence for law enforcement and domestic abuse victims. What enhancements to Texas law would help law enforcement Confiscate guns from felons and domestic abusers. So I think I'll start with the sheriff. I think give us, give us a little more teeth uh, in the law that would allow us to just automatically take the guns uh, without having to get a warrant um, and, and just you know, not have to even ask. It's just, if we're there for a family violence call, uh, we're taking the guns. They may just be for tonight or a week or two until you can come down to the property room but I, I think, if nothing else, that's an easy start. That's low-hanging fruit right there. But I don't think it's going to be an easy fight for, for the, the uh, Bear County delegation. Senator? We, we will. We will I, I love when I get common sense you know, suggestions, and we will push them. We'll go through them. Sure. But I can tell you, uh, unfortunately, how many of you think that not texting and driving makes common sense? Raise your hand if you <laughs> that took That took about 10 years to get passed. You know, and, and, and so all I'm saying is we will, we will do it, but, but, you know, it's going to be hard, and there's going to be a lot of people who say that we're just trying to grab people's guns, take their guns. And, and I, I, think, I think we need to have statistics and facts. I think you need to show that the number of 
homicides that occur because of domestic violence. I, I think that the, the people who, who perish in those situations, I, I, would, I would guess anecdotally the majority are women and children. And then, unfortunately, sometimes like what I've seen and read, it's, it's, it's homicide, suicide. Then the shooter takes their own life. And so we need to prevent this situation. And in order to prevent it, why wouldn't you, if you have a domestic violence situation, say, hey, hey time out. We're going to do a temporary, you know, just present us with your guns. We can go get a warrant. Why don't you do it voluntarily? When everything's fine and you've found your apartment, you can come back and get your guns and you're out of the house or whatever the situation you guys come, come to an agreement with. We need to figure this out. Um, but it, it won't be easy, but we, we, will, we will work on that. I think it just, it's just common sense. And so, unfortunately, it should be easier than it is. Anyone else? All right. Uh, this should be th uh, thought provoking. Do you think requiring gun owners to register and insure their guns similar to vehicles will help reduce gun violence? <laughs> Who wants to take a stab at that? Professor? You have a thought on that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Doctor? I, I think that, I mean, it, it would make sense in terms of it, just like car insurance or your house insurance. I mean, the, uh, uh, so I, I think that would have a lot. Of, it certainly it would allow victims to uh, be able to pay for medical care or emotional damages or other kinds of things that might, that might occur. So, I, and I don't see, again, it doesn't take anyone, the amount of insurance, the charges could be modest so that it doesn't, uh, greatly overwhelm people's uh, inability to get a firearm, but I think it would, it would definitely give a, light, a layer, it, it would definitely give a layer of, pr of protection. Okay. Reverend, you have a thought on that, or Jose, or Javier? I, I, look, as cool as it sounds, I think, it, I think it's a bit of a pipe dream. Uh, I just don't see that ever happening, because let's be honest, uh, let's take this suspect that, that killed my canine deputy the other night. That guy's never going to pay his insurance premiums. He's never going to do things legally. Um, chances are he stole that gun anyway. We haven't found that out yet. But I just think that you're going to have um, criminals are going to continue to be criminals and circumvent the laws, and that'll just be another law that they thumb their nose at, to be honest with you. I, I, think, it's, I think it's unrealistic expectation. Uh, you know, evidence of what he just said, how many people drive without insurance? How many people drive without insurance? How many people are out driving their car with no insurance? Thousands. So this is going to be hard to get that to do. I honestly, really, what I'd love to see is Dr. Pliska help us with what are the root causes where do kids start getting their heads screwed up? At what age? And how can we prevent that? Because the, the sooner we help the kids get on the right track, the better, the less work we're going to have to do on the back end of these things. You know what I'm saying? And so what can we do? Is it the foster care system? Is it, uh, is it drugs and alcohol? Is it rehabilitation? How can we help the kids in the household not be so disconnected from reality? Look, when the issue of, of uh, suicide rate, the teen suicide rate has tripled in Bear County in the last probably five or six years. And I went to talk to my teenagers about this. Hey, well, hey, this is, is kind of scary. What do you know about this? Oh, yeah, Dad, uh, I know tons of people who have tried to commit suicide. What? what? Yeah, like nothing. Like I was saying nothing. Like, like it, was, it meant it was no big deal. Yeah. I mean, in sixth grade, little girls are cutting themselves. You know, and I don't understand it. And they're all sharing it on social media. So we have a lot of work to do. I think, look, gun violence is real, but I think it's, a, it's symptomatic of a larger problem. I think you're right, Al, that there are weapons of mass destruction that should not be in the hands of everyday citizens. Obviously, they, 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 they realize that with the pressure on the bump stock situation. Um, but, but no one needs a, a, you know, a magazine with 50, 50 rounds in it to defend their house. You know? There are just certain things that need to be common sense. 
I think I like to, I think the school-based mental health services is a really good place to start. One of the big barriers that keeps particularly uh, working families from seeking mental health care, you know, you get a call from the school, you know, your child has, you know, said he wanted to hurt himself or he got in a, uh, you know, he's uh, been depressed. Well, the parent has to, you know, go to their insurance panel, call somebody, make multiple calls, finally get an appointment, have a, take off work. Boss says, no, you can't take off work. Uh, the... Uh, it just delays the whole process. A lot of people give up, and if if there were, if those services were directly in the school, the child could be served, but also the family could come and get family therapy. Uh, I think that would really be a, a, a core preventative measure. Uh, I think at at the other end of the severity spectrum, uh, for those kids with ser kids with serious mental illness, we probably need to invest a little bit more in intensive treatment or residential treatment. Really, Texas, we have Waco Center for Youth. We have Waco, Waco Center for Youth, uh, who uh, you know is, is the only long-term residential facility that the state runs. We have other residential treatment facilities, but for those uh, kids that really need that intensive long-term care, uh, that's a definite, a, a definite gap in the system, and that's where we could really prevent kids from uh, going into a, a lifelong uh, course of substance abuse, mental illness, or, or, or criminal behavior. To show you, uh, there are many things that we would have to undo to get to where some of you might be thinking we need to be going in that particular direction, such as identifying the gun owners and registering and so on. So I wanted, I, I had old notes from years ago, but this is really amazing. The Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms, and Explosives is forbidden by law from having a database that could quickly be searched to identify who has purchased rifles and guns. You're outlaw. You, they can't collect that kind of information. This is a better one. Now, I believe this is true, Doctor. I'm not real sure, but you know, we we do have an opioid epidemic and they try to keep track of the pharmacists and where all this is coming from and you know there are red flags if maybe there's somebody dispensing more than they should you know we have records for that but what about this congress barred government in 2003 from publishing records of how many guns are sold by stores used by criminals when, what if there was a store that's selling all these guns and probably taking them to Mexico and everything else? You can't, I mean, this is really a huge, huge issue. Uh, and we need to, stay, we're probably going to have to take the, the baby steps, but I think we're identifying some steps that we'll be able to take. Uh, Senator Menendez and others after uh, Jose, what is the role of the NRA in preventing gun legislation? Charlie, really? You wrote that that question. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, I, no. I expected more from you, Charlie. But um, <laughs> oh, come on, guys. Look, uh, Austin. Whether it's Austin, whether it's Washington, not so much at City Hall, but there are special interest groups everywhere. And wherever there's a special interest, you know, I remember uh, growing up with my father who was born in 1922, who grew up in rural, riding a horse for 37 years of his life, um, hunted and fished and outdoorsmen. I remember back then the NRA being sort of like where you'd learn the safety programs and these different things. It was a different thing. And now it seems like the manufacturers have taken over and they use it as the, the ability to protect their, their rights to sell whatever they want to sell, you know? And, and I, I, yes, the NRA has, has an arm in Austin, and, and they, there's, other, there's others, and in Washington. And they, you know, and they have the ability to, to keep track of who's doing what, and they go advocate. And they, they worry, and they t express those concerns that w when we're trying to do things that sometimes we think of as common sense, it's just an excuse to take people's guns. And the biggest thing they say, Charlie, that, that, that's, that's their biggest thing is, if you take their guns as you're just taking them from law-abiding citizen, the criminals are always going to have them. Okay, I'll grant you that. But, but maybe it's a law-abiding citizen who is happy to having a mental crisis 
or is happening is happening to go through a bad divorce or just lost their job and they and they're not in a mental state to own that gun right now and it's not like you know hey we're saying you can never own it again in most cases but but can't we be common sense in some approach so yeah they're there charlie but that's kind of where i was saying that's where mom's demand action seems to have filled a, a void there wasn't anybody on the other side saying Hey, time out. There's some of us sensible voters out here, and we also want attention because it almost seems like in Austin or Washington, it's like the loudest and squeakiest wheels get the attention. Now, lots of these special interest groups, too, they put together political action committees, and they raise a lot of money, and they invest money in, in campaigns. And where groups like Moms Demand Action can uh, have, I've seen them be effective, it's not that they're writing checks, but they're, they're doing just as good with people power. With, with volunteering, with doing things, with helping the people that, that are running, saying we support this candidate and we're behind them and, and that brings along a lot of other people. And so uh, all of these groups can be offset, but it takes work. And the problem that I see for years, what I've seen uh, groups when there's a, a us versus them, it's when one group is not actively engaged, they're gonna be on the losing side. But when we're actively engaged in terms of supporting your candidates who think and represent you the way you think, you're going to be on the right side. You're going you're to have more success. So yes, no, there's, there's very actively involved involvement. Um, and, and, you know, look, uh, Texas has been a place where they've been very comfortable for a long time. Where uh, even this, we still, they still have two-thirds of control of, of both chambers, and they have the governorship, and so... You know, it's, it's, it's why it's so hard to get something changed. So it's why, honestly, rather than try to demonize folks, I have to work hard to try to build bridges. That's the only way I'm going to get anything done, is to build bridges. Uh, because I, if I'm going in there trying to throw on, uh, you know, my, my fighting gear, the, the numbers just aren't there for me. I, 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 you know, you know the numbers in the Senate, the numbers in the House. And so we have to be smart about how we get things done. Anyone else an opinion on the influence of the NRA on gun legislation? The odd thing is that I know many NRA uh, members that really believe that, uh, and this is what they strive for, is responsible gun ownership. It's not all what you always hear there. I mean, they have members, and I think you the thing is, we ought to be joining the NRA. I, I own a firearm, I should join and have, be a voice heard in these organizations. Because I think there are a lot of reasonable people, they just are never ever heard. Uh, one thing that was pointed out, I think the senator was talking about, well, law-abiding citizens and such, getting a gun at a time when, as the doctors pointed out, they may not be mentally stable. They're in an emotional state where they might harm someone else. But what about harming yourself? And uh, this was a startling uh, statistic, but nine out of 10 suicide attempts by guns are lethal. And half of all suicides are by guns. And you always hear about a young person who gets a, who takes the gun and there is. So I think there are different ways of approaching it, not just that people are victims of violence, but what happens when people that aren't stable in an emotional state where they harm themselves because Firearms are so lethal, unlike anything else. Let's see, we're gonna... How dangerous are 3D printed guns? Would banning them be a violation of the Second Amendment, Professor Kaufman? <laughs> I, I, that has been brought up. Whether, whether 3D guns violate or are a pro, prohibition of... of okay, so it was an important point I just made. I, uh, whether whether uh, prohibiting 3D guns would be prohibited by the Second Amendment, uh, I don't think it would. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there are certainly arguments made that persons have a First Amendment right uh, to speak and to share plans, uh, to use their 3D printers for whatever purpose uh, they wish. Uh, but I think the interest in safety are so great that they would outweigh. Anyone else? This is on 3D. 
I just, you know, I, I don't think, I don't really call it, consider them a serious threat. Um, I think that it's just as easy, seriously, if I'm a criminal, to go break into a car, and chances are it's going to have a gun under the front seat. Um, it, especially when so many of us that, that, that are gun owners love to plaster those stickers on the back of our car that just paint a target. Come on and get my gun while I'm asleep. Come on and break my window. So I just, I just don't see them as that big of a threat. I think the bigger threat is stolen guns uh, that fall into the wrong hands because many gun owners are, are quite careless with their guns, to be honest with you. That's my biggest issue is, is parents who lawfully own guns but don't, don't keep them locked up yeah. and, and, and just keep them easily accessible. And, and how many senseless, needless deaths of little kids do we need to have before someone... I think we should hold adults responsible just like if, if a kid comes to your house and your, your child has a party and they get drunk, you're responsible for what happens to that. So, so why shouldn't we be responsible for what these kids do with your guns if you didn't keep have them locked up or held in a in a safe place safe way why aren't gun owners made responsible for crimes committed by others with guns they own Uh, well, let's say I, I have a gun. I have it in the car under the seat. Someone breaks in. They steal the gun. They shoot somebody. Can you sue that? Can you sue me for keeping the gun under the seat, leaving the door open to the car or whatever? Anyone have an opinion on that? Not my area of law. <laughs> I think, you know, I know there have been lawsuits out there. They have not been very successful. Um, I mean, I know of a couple of them right now where it's someone saying that they, they did not train adequately for a licensed, uh, for a security officer who has to get a license. Uh, he left the gun uh, exposed there on the bed, and someone's child got hold of it. It discharged and killed another child. So that's an ongoing lawsuit. Chances of, of it succeeding are pretty slim. Yeah. I do believe that uh, civil remedies would be one way of instilling responsibility. If there, I've always believed this, and uh, the professor and others here would probably agree. If, if there's no accountability, if there's no liability, generally there's no accountability. So what makes people responsible is that there's some liability out there for some behavior. As an aside, real quick, I have a 38 special. It's a little pistol. I mean, well, I mean, it's a, it's a 38, and it was a gift from my bailiff and my staff when I was in court. The only condition was that I not bring it to court because they didn't trust <laughs> the way I would handle it. He said, "The only gun in the courtroom is mine," and that was the previous uh, two sheriffs or three sheriffs ago, uh, he said, this is for your protection at home. So that's just universally understood, that you're going to have a gun in your house. Uh, but just maybe safe, uh, keep it in a safe place, learn to use it. Uh, no one is going to be taking anyone's gun away. And Senator Menendez is pointing something out that's so important, because as soon as you start talking about gun safety, that means gun control. Gun control means gun confiscation, and you lose. You, you'll never get anywhere. This is, I, I expect an answer from all of you on this one, because this, this should get you in a lot of trouble, but it, if, if you, it's almost self-evident. <clears throat> is gun violence a male issue? Do we, <laughs> do we need a male solution? What about the role of fathers? Short answer to that the short answer to that is yes. Aggressive behavior, problems with aggressive behavior, are more common among among males, and that's been true since the issue's been. Please, I want to hear this. You're gonna have to hold it real close, doctor, and it's just almost the, touching uh, your lips. It, it, that um, start, let me start over. So uh, the uh, aggressive behavior and problems with aggressive behavior has been predominantly a problem among males since the issue has been studied for hundreds of years. We are seeing that changing, though. So 
uh, with all the other changes in society, the number of girls who get into trouble with aggressive behavior is in fact increasing. And in fact, through social media, there's a different kind of aggression, the kind of social aggression, excluding people, saying mean things, and such that sometimes can be as damaging as, as you know, the, the boys punching each other in the nose on the playground. The, um, and we have had a, uh, over the last uh, uh, half century or so, an increase in, in boys who grow up without any uh, significant male influence in their life, and that probably does have an impact as well. These deep social trends are really difficult to get a, a handle on and prescribe a, a social policy that would, that would reverse them. Anyone else on whether gun violence is really a male issue, and if it is, how we would address that? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think it's everybody's issue to start off with. Now, now I can say uh, pretty definitively that, that most of the perpetrators in gun violence, be it active shooter situations uh, or family violence situations, most of the perpetrators are male. Uh, but was, so was, uh, was the second part uh, seriously, part of the question is: Should it be a male solution, sir? Was that was that yeah. true? Was is that there a, a, okay. if, it, if it's a male problem, should there be something tailored to address the male actor? Okay, um, I don't think that I don't think it's a male solution. I think it's it's again it's all it's all of our our solution to it. Um, I don't think that there, for example, I think there's groups that do great work, and we've we keep giving you guys shout out, shout outs, but the the moms demand action. I don't think there are any male moms. Are there any male moms? Okay, well, there you go. But, but again, that's a group that's, that's very strong, but y'all are probably mostly, mostly female? Mostly? I think, I think that uh, I think it's everybody's solution. I mean, look, males, we've been running government uh, for a long, long time. How's that working out? I think that, <laughs> I, I think that, that it's all of our solution to, together. So, so, Charlie, you know what it reminds me of? The issue of illiteracy. The issue of illiteracy has two, two ends, two spectrums. You have to treat, make sure that children read on grade level by third grade or you're going to lose them, right? But, what, but do you give up on the adults who don't read? No. So the issue with, with gun violence is I think you have to treat mental health and illness Look, we focused for years on the President's Council on Health. How many sit-ups can your kid do? How many push-ups? How fast can they run? Well, what, what the heck? What about their mental health, their emotional health? You know, what about the whole kid? The kid, the, 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 I think that's even more important. The emotional and mental health of the children is, is more important, as important, but as, it, it can't be less important than their physical health. Uh, our kids today are suffering more from anxiety, from depression, from a lot of things. They're living in these stupid things. You've seen me addicted looking at this stupid thing the whole time. I'm just as addicted. I'm staring at this damn thing, and I can't put it down. And, and I'm, my, I'm watching my kids, and they're the one thing I want to strangle whoever invented Snapchat, taking their picture and doing this. And I ask my kids, what are you doing? I'm talking to my friends. What do you mean you're talking? All they do is take pictures. And then they, they take a picture of what they do, and they have a string, and they have to keep it going. And then they'll tell you, a beautiful child will tell you, why am I so ugly? What? What do you mean, why are you so Why am I not pretty? Why am I not that? And they're sitting there staring and trying to understand why they don't compare to someone else, and they never stop doing this. And so I think they're not getting enough sleep. I don't think they're, they're, I don't think they're stopping to recharge their batteries, stopping to just to read, to eat, to have some exercise. They're just focused on these things. So. Do, do men tend to use more violent behavior to commit suicide? Yes. Do they do it to, to solve problems? Yes. Do they, do, do they use more aggressive ways? Yes. But does that mean that, that we ignore the mental health of women? No. I think this is a solution, a problem that, that we're just seeing men use the guns, manifest the violence in, through the guns more often than women, but the problem is just as serious for boys and girls. Anyone else? This is going to be the last question, and it's really a great one because I, 
most of y'all are thinking, well, I better start talking to my member of Congress about doing something at the federal level. Others are saying, I'm going to go up there and talk to Senator Menendez in Austin. But what about acting locally? Remember, all politics is local. There's a reason for that. And this is the question, is if I can make this out real clearly here. Would it make sense to parlay San Antonio's charter as a compassionate city to help promote, A, more civic dialogue, B, compassion education for our children, C, sensible laws and regulations to help reduce harm from gun violence? Our city would be a model city for other cities, municipalities, states, et cetera. In other words, can something be done locally? I know that there are cities throughout the nation that are. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day about Boulder, Colorado. Very aggressive law. I don't know if it's going to withstand you know, scrutiny um, when the courts get it. But what about doing something locally? One case that the uh, back to the legal stuff that the Supreme Court's agreed to hear is from New York City, and New York City has a law that uh, you cannot carry a gun from place to place. You can have a gun, a handgun, in your home, but you cannot carry it anywhere in the city except if you have a license. You can carry it to a licensed uh, uh, what do they call it? Where you shoot, you practice gun, you practice uh, uh, shooting range. And that's it. And you can't take the guns out of the city, and you can't take them anywhere in the city except to a, a city licensed shooting range. And that's, now that's pushing it. But that would make it much easier, uh, although you're right, the, the criminals might still have guns, but a uh, sheriff would know if somebody's carrying a gun that it's an illegal gun, unless they're a member of the sheriff of the police department, and they would know that. Uh, people would make it much clearer when you could carry a gun and when you couldn't. So I think that's something that cities can do. It's within city powers. Again, you have politics working at all levels. Uh, but it is something a city could do. So you're being realistic. I'm not being realistic. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, you need any help, let's say, from city leaders, city council, uh, is thinking in terms of the UT Health Science Center in San Antonio? I think, I think the, the more there are community programs where um, kids can go and get mentored, uh, that can kind of prevent the, uh, the development of the aggressive behavior that ultimately in some, is going to culminate in the gun violence. So that's the main thing I could think of doing locally. Citizens, you know, volunteering for CASA or at your local school, uh, taking some time to mentor some kids, that, that really can have a very direct in, input. I mean, I get letters from families that I treated 20 years ago, and I didn't see them that intensively in therapy. You know, these weren't people that were in therapy. They weren't in therapy for years. I might have seen them, you know, four or five times, and they'll say, oh, well, it really had a big impact. It made a difference. So you think, well, you know, if I just go to the local elementary school and I tutor a few times a week, that's not going to have a big impact. You know, absolutely not. It's gonna, it can have a potentially huge impact. Reverend, you already pointed out maybe some sort of um, ecumenical initiative. What about locally and having city government help you? Well, again, I think we're, we're starting to, to do that. Um, and there are a couple of other interfaith organizations that are working on some of these issues in San Antonio. Um, and so I, I do see some some progress being made. I have a lot of hope for more progress being made, if that makes sense. And so, sure. I, and I'm super happy to funnel any ideas that you all have about um, the way that uh, churches and mosques and temples and other institutions can help politicians understand the bigger picture. Okay. Senator, what would be the role for local government? What do you think? So, uh, you, you alluded to it a second ago. So, you know, in North Texas, we have, you know, those of us down here, we're familiar with the Eagle Ford Shale down south of us. In North Texas, they had a different shale play that was causing people to have wells in their backyards. So Tarrant and some other Arlington, I forget what cities, there was a city that, Denton, that made it illegal to have oil wells in the city. And then the city of Austin decided, well, we're going to protect X number of trees. And then all of a sudden, the next session, 
We're like, well, we're going to make a law that cities can't pass laws to infringe on what we sow. I think the best thing that we can do as a city is to support the mental health initiatives and, and how can we get down at the core level, number one, on the, the youth side, and on, the, on this side of the equation, what can we do to help address the issues of domestic violence, of issues where there is preventable gun violence? Folks, we all know in this room, just like we're not going to eliminate all drunk driving, we still have laws, but what I like to do is focus on the areas where we can prevent the most. And I think domestic violence is one of the areas we can prevent the most. One of the things that we have a distinction that I hate is that we're one of the cities that has the highest per capita consumption of alcohol, of beer. A lot of this leads to other issues, health issues, violence issues, domestic violence, so, uh, you know, stupid things. So I think there's a lot of things that we can work on as a city to look at the overall health of our, cons of our citizens. And, and I think that's, that's something that we could do as a city that would not be prevented by the state. Um, I, I, I don't want to do any more sort of, you know, magic wand wishful thinking. I want to work on stuff that I think we could actually do. Now, if you want to do more, then every election cycle, make sure you and everybody that you agree with or that believes like you do goes out to vote for people and make changes in areas where people don't agree with you. You know, that's the only way that's going to happen. Uh, but that's going to take time. And so in the short run is, but I think you also, you know, if you're, you're talking to, you have to talk to health professionals, talk to the city, talk to schools. What are schools doing? For years, schools have not wanted to talk about mental health or, or anything like this. And school districts, we're not funding them enough to give them the counselors that they need. In high schools, when you talk about a counselor, it's all academic advisement. It's, I, I, I was trying to pass the cyberbullying bill, and they were telling me, well, we don't have emotional, that mental health was brought in because nobody was talking to the kids about mental health and their emotional. So there is a lot, there's huge gaps on stuff that we can do, but it needs to be a community-wide effort. It has to be a comprehensive effort. Sheriff Salazar, yes, is there a role for local government, let's say county or city uh, commissioner's court, city, uh, city council, as far as anything to reduce gun violence? I think, I think the that there is. I think we can, uh, certainly from a county official perspective, uh, anytime uh, one, of the legislative, uh, one of the legislators needs me to come up and support something, uh, I'm there. And so, yeah, certainly uh, myself or any of the other county officials can do that. Uh, I don't believe there's anything prohibiting a city official from doing that. Uh, but from a citizen's perspective, uh, shoe leather and elbow grease. Get involved in anything that you can. Come out and volunteer for one of the nonprofits that, that, uh, that works uh, in furtherance of, of one of the causes that you believe in. Volunteer for one of our law enforcement agencies. I have a volunteer corps at the sheriff's office, and we'd love to have... Uh, folks that are experts in a variety of fields. Um, Pat Castillo, I'd love to have her helping us out with family violence stuff, and I know she will if I ask. Uh, but come on out and volunteer. Volunteer for the campaign of a candidate that you that you support for for whatever cause. Get out there and and, and put some sweat equity into it, and that's how we're going to change this thing. So Charlie, but also the thing you know, I was thinking about. We have a lot of children who don't have mentors at home. Look, I don't know if y'all know this. One in four kids doesn't eat at home. They only eat at school. We have a backpack program that the food bank sends kids with backpacks on the weekends full of stuff so that they can fix food for themselves and their siblings. So we have a lot of absentee parents in people's homes. So th these kids are raising themselves. And they're, they're looking for other family role models. And those family role models tend to be sometimes people who don't have their best interests, gang members and others. And so. We have a lot of work in, in the, going into the schools and volunteering and reading to these kids and taking an interest and letting them hope, find that there maybe there's hope because a lot of these kids don't think they're going to be 25 or 30. So when you don't have hope to see, you know, a, a mid midlife, then what do you care? It doesn't matter. Oh, take the gun. Go do a car drive-by. Do Go be a lookout. Do this. Do you, don't you see that every day? And so we have, we need, we have a great need that we can address by going 
into the poverty that we have as a city. And we need to address that. I think if we address that, we also will, can hit the impact of alcohol dependency, drug and alcohol dependency, and mental health. So there's a lot of root cause issues that we need to get to. Well, I, I want to thank the, I'm sorry. Of course. Well, I know that many of you were hoping that we would have the, just these grand scale plans that would take care of the issues. But remember what we entitled the presentation, gun violence, what can capitalize be done? What realistically can we do to get it started again? Because it's really at a standstill. Each of you should leave tonight with an idea that came from this panel as to what you can do starting tomorrow, if not tonight. And I want to thank the panel, and I want to hand it back over to the president. And again, it was good to see you all. Thank you very much for the privilege. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, um, you know, wouldn't you agree it was a great discussion and a great panel that we had? You know, I think you all did the... I want to thank Professor Kaufman. I want to thank Senator Jose Menendez, Dr. Stephen Pliska, Reverend Anna Gordy, and Sheriff Salazar. And last but not least, I want to thank our moderator, because no discussion is complete without a good moderator. I also want to mention that this program was live streamed by Nowcast. And I want to thank Charlotte Ann for doing that. And you can view it later on our website or on the website of Nowcast. And thank you all for joining us. And keep joining us for these wonderful programs that we put together. It's mainly for the you know, community members to come and get educated about it. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>